a sprint so kick ass right yeah everybody that is watching is probably also got some ideas on how to make sprints kick ass so we encourage you to share on twitter linkedin or whatever you prefer to share your social shares with the hashtag design sprint hashtag kick ass a combination so that other folks looking for design sprint can also get your insights and we're gonna have 30 minutes give or take of the uh, sharing and then i'll be collecting questions uh, and please use the q a section of the um, of the of the app and uh, i'll be collecting curating and, and asking the uh, so i mean we'll have 30 more minutes after that whoever wants to stay to get those questions uh, answered yeah that's a time timer right Dee? yep got it yeah. ready all right so with that and we have around 400 people live right now probably some more will be connecting in a bit so d show us take it away thanks mariano um so i've got my time timer set for 30 minutes um so let's see if i can make it i have a lot of content to share with you um and a lot of stuff that is in our paid training as well so you're really getting a lot of um a lot of things that people pay actually lots of money to hear from us so i hope it's going to be really useful and interesting for you and i hope i can stick to my 30 minutes and i'll be maybe talking quickly um to get through it all and then really write down those questions and keep them for the end um, so that mariana can um can feed them to us afterwards and we can have a good q a ah yes and one thing is that people don't worry we are recording this so worst case scenario, if you need to review it or share with some other people, we'll send a follow up after this. So D, go ahead. Okay, great. So for anyone that hasn't heard of AJ and Smart yet, AJ and Smart are a pure 100% design sprint company. It's the only thing we do. We run design sprints and we teach design sprints and that's all of our business. So today I'm sharing with you some of the really special things that we do that makes us the world leader in design sprints so that you can do them, so that you can steal them and do them yourself and make your sprints kick ass. So to start, just really quickly, um, I think most people who are here know what a design sprint is. Um, just in case there's anyone joining who's just heard about design sprints for the first time and is joining to hear more about them, the, um, the design sprint was created by a guy called Jake Knapp who wrote a book called Sprint about three years ago um, that really outlined this process and this new mindset, this new way of working that is the design sprint. I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail at all about what a design sprint is and exactly how it works and what it looks like, but to give the most quick overview, it's a week long process. And in the design sprint 2.0 that AJ and Smart have created, it's a four day process where you go through a series of exercises, a few with the full diverse team of people who have come together to solve a challenge and do a series of exercises uh, in the first two days and then on the Wednesday prototype an idea and on the Thursday test that idea with real users and see if you can actually validate a new solution to solve a problem and get it out to market knowing that it will actually work. So this is like super quick overview of what a design sprint actually is and now the rest of what I'm going to be sharing with you today is really the things that you can do for most people that are maybe joining now and you've tried running design sprints or maybe you're running a lot of design sprints. I'm really gonna share some secrets and tips and tricks with you that we've developed over years of only running design sprints every single week. Before we actually get started, I'll show you a one example of um, the outcome of a design sprint that we've, uh, we use as a showcase of how design sprints work. This is, uh, the example is from a company called Share Foods, and they first came to us wanting to create a mobile app to uh, plug in to the World Food Program, feeding kids all around the world, and make a way for people to much more easily donate money to charity. So different ways than, than actually just people on the streets trying to get charity donations and other forms of charity donations, but something that could really engage with people and get people to share and uh, um, especially donate and give meals to kids in need. So the challenge was to create something that would really engage with people and people would really use. It started off 
in a room just this this is the exact photo of the thing this is the the guy standing kind of facing us is the CEO of the company who worked at the World Food Program and left to uh, to start this new idea, this new um, way of engaging with people and getting more donations. So we started in this room doing these workshop exercises. There were really a lot of things. I'm not going to show every detail, but this is some of the real artifacts that came from the sprint. This rapid sketching is part of the process, really coming up with lots of different ideas and everyone involved sketching and coming up with lots of different possible solutions then making a really quick in one day prototype and mock-up of what the idea is or what the different ideas and how they could work. And then actually in the end, this was the real first version of the app that was actually released after validating the ideas with real people, with people actually testing if they would use this and if it would work. And then in a second sprint, we also they wanted to see if they could find another way of engaging with people and getting even more donations. And the idea was that a food product that someone could buy off a shelf and it was a one-for-one -one product that if you buy one of these food products, a meal gets donated to a child who needs a meal. So this really one-for-one -one model. And they wanted to see if they could create a snack bar that was appealing enough on the supermarket shelf so that people would actually buy it and it would actually work as a great funnel for these donations to go into the World Food Program. So um, in this example, the prototype was actually really physically designing the packaging, what it looks like and mocking it up and putting it against all the other bars on this fake supermarket shelf and testing with people that would come in to see if they would pick up the bar. So the prototype doesn't have to be a digital thing, can be really anything to test if your idea is going to work. So in this case, we really mocked up packaging and printed on plastic and mocked up these food bars. And then this is the actual um, end result, um, the product that is now in supermarket shelves that people are actually buying. So this was just a super, super quick overview of the kinds of things that you see in design sprints, the types of products and the ways of testing and validating these ideas really quickly in a week just to give anyone who doesn't quite know yet exactly how it works this look really quickly at what we're actually doing when we're talking about design sprints. Now there's the obligatory slide of the companies that AJ and Smart works with. So we've really worked with tons of different types of companies, um, uh, clothing companies, World Food Program, banks, um, companies like eBay, Lego, we do a lot of work with. So really there's a huge range across lots of different industries um, and lots of different types of products that you can really apply design sprints to. A little bit about me before we really get into the main content now. I am Australian. You may, if you're wondering and trying to pick my accent. Um, I've been working in product design for about 10 years. I actually have a computer science background and moved straight into product design. I also am a product strategy mentor for some startup accelerators, um, running also some great design events like the Global Service Jam. And my role here at AJ and Smart, even though I was hired as a product designer to run sprints and solve product problems, is now the head of design sprint training. So I'm really going around the world, training all these uh, companies like some of the names that you just saw in how they can use design sprints themselves um, to solve their own product challenges. And a lot of the examples that we see are companies seeing design sprints, maybe coming to us to run a design sprint and then seeing the power of this way of working where you can really validate your ideas before spending months and millions of dollars um, investing in, in building them. So really testing and validating an idea before you start investing all of that time and money. So in this photo, as a workshop I actually did in San Francisco with Jake Knapp, the author is in the background there really teaching all of these companies, different companies, how to use this process. We also have an online um, masterclass in the design sprint. So I'm also then teaching in an online video course, which also has lots of downloadable resources that people can use to start running their own design sprints much more quickly than we had to really spend a long time becoming experts in this, but now we're really providing all of our resources and all of our knowledge, some of which I'm also giving to you today for free. Um, as some of the content from this masterclass as well. So, we'll share, we'll share oh, yeah. with you, uh, so that everybody watching can can go deeper uh, and take that course. Pardon? 
we'll share the link. Yeah, fantastic. Cool. Yeah, this is a new thing we've launched uh, six months ago, and it's really um, become really much more popular than we realized it would be. So in the next 24 minutes, I actually misestimated this. So in about the next 22 minutes, I am going to talk about these things, how you can prepare better for your own design sprints and have a lot more, uh, less stress um, and be more, feel more prepared going into a design sprint. I'm going to share some real facilitation secrets that are actually directly from an advanced facilitation training that uh, we also give to also really shortcut and just give you this feeling of confidence and removal of stress from your facilitation. If people have really been running their own design sprints already, you'll know what I mean when I say this. It can take a while to really build up that confidence, but there's a few secrets you can apply immediately to really um, make you feel confident straight away. And how to give clear instructions when you're actually delivering a design sprint also helps remove so much pressure and stress because every time someone asks a question, I don't understand why are we doing this, it interrupts your flow. So really some secrets to how to really deliver your instructions so that you have less of these interruptions. And then some really special touches that are some of the reasons why AJ and Smart is known as the Michelin star experience of design sprints. So some of the things that we do to go above and beyond and really deliver amazing experience and that makes people keep coming back. We like to say that we want people to feel like it's the day before Christmas when they're about to come to AJ and Smart and do a design sprint. So first off, how to prepare and really feel um, like you're ready immediately as you walk in the room on that Monday morning. First, I'll just say a little bit about how we used to do sprints. We really believe that the sprint is everything you need. You don't need to do a ton of preparation before a sprint. If you start putting days and weeks worth of work before a sprint, it becomes a much bigger, chunkier thing and a lot more effort and becomes less likely that you'll just be able to use one straight away. Like, let's do a sprint next week. Um, so how we used to do it was really just have a general understanding from our clients what their challenges were. And we would just go in on the Monday morning and start with the first exercise, which is gathering information from the experts who, who have the knowledge. And we didn't do any other preparation other than that. And it really still worked, but we realized that we could do just a little bit of prep to give ourselves that extra boost of confidence going into the room on Monday. So now what we do is a really light, high level preparation of just some guesses or drafts of some of the steps in the sprint. For those who, who already recognize and know what these are, they're the expert interviews. So we're already making some, actually asking some questions and getting some information from the experts, the people who have the knowledge, um, who know what the challenges are. We're drafting up our first guess of what the map could look like. We're also guessing and drafting up the long-term goal and the sprint questions and writing some guesses of what we think those are. And we're starting to already collect some lightning demos, which are the demos of things outside in the world around us that we could also say, already say, this could be a good example for us to look at, kind of like benchmarks. And we're already starting to have a guess at what kinds of people we might want to do tests with when it comes to the end of the week. And we're really only spending um, three to four hours on all of this. So it's just the first little guess and draft of these things. It's not going really in depth because in the sprint, you do all of these exercises, but we're starting to ask some questions and draft up what we think they might be. So this is an example of a real survey that we've sent to one of our clients that's asking these types of questions to try and get the first guesses of that, all of that information. So what their purposes are for doing the sprint, whether they're caring about user engagement or monetization, or just getting alignment for their teams. What are the things that they're caring about? And what the next steps for them are. So we're really trying to find out what are their uh, motivations? What's the purpose for them doing this and being here? What's the core problems that they're trying to find answers to? And then we're asking questions about who their users are, uh, what kinds of things they, uh, having, they think they're having problems with, what other products and, and things that they are competing with or getting inspiration from 
so that we're starting to fill in this picture and we're able to draft up those things, the map, the goal, the questions. All of this is helping us make a, a first start of these drafts. And for an example, this is what a draft map um, looks like from a real sprint. So taking just five or 10 minutes to quickly sketch up what we think. So if you're a facilitator of a sprint and you're pulling a team together, whether it's clients or internally, you can already start making a guess at what you think the map would look like. And it's just a guess so that the whole purpose of all of this prep and drafting up is so that when you get up at that whiteboard or you, you get up to start facilitating an exercise, you're not starting from a blank whiteboard, a blank, a blank canvas. You're able to say, what about this? How about it starts like this? Is that right? Is that wrong? And you're already starting with some confidence instead of having to really draw out from all of your participants every single piece of information. If you've just got that guess in your head, you can start writing something and then see what people are saying. No, that's not quite right. Actually, we need to add this as well. And it just gives you that boost of knowing where you want to start. So this is also an example of an email that we would send to our clients to just ask them more detail about their users um, so that we have this context of who their users are, uh, what kinds of, if they have any data already about um, how users are using their products and services. So we can just start to get a picture of, okay, we can already start to put some feelers out to try and attract the right types of um, people to see and get a pool of users ready that by the end of the sprint, when we're ready to test, we'll have a pool to draw the right types of users from once we have a bit more information. The, and while you're doing this, as well as building up your own confidence and being ready at that whiteboard for each exercise, you're also actually onboarding your participants and the people who are coming into the sprint by just asking them a few questions in advance. You're already getting them prepared for what is going to come and they're not going to be so shocked or surprised or, or not understanding what's coming next when you're going through each of the exercises. So this onboarding also helps and makes the whole sprint run more smoothly. So onto some facilitation secrets. These are really big things that we just had to learn slowly, one step at a time by making mistakes. So we're really um, happy to share these with people so that you can just take these and not have to go through those same um, mistakes and, and hurdles. The first one feels quite simple, but it is so, so uh, effective that I really hope if, you, if there's one thing you take away from this, it's this one. This will make your facilitation life so much smoother. It is setting expectations for your participants and preparing them for what's about to come because we uh, work with lots of different types of companies and really often they're companies that are used to working in much more traditional ways, long projects, lots of meetings, lots of roundabout discussions and disagreements and, and um, mis misunderstandings, that when you put them into a room and say, right, we've got 10 minutes for this exercise, quickly write down what you're thinking, they, they can start to feel uncomfortable, like this wasn't enough time, I don't understand what we're doing here, Why we're, we're going to lose ideas, um, what about all these other things that we didn't have time for? So a super simple way to smooth out this process, stop these kind of questions and challenges coming up from people because they're suddenly feeling uncomfortable in this situation, you can simply say these things up front. Things like, this will probably feel really rushed. It will probably feel like we don't have enough time. It will feel like we're losing ideas because we are going to leave some things on the table and we're going, the power of the sprint is, choosing a direction and moving forward with that one choice so that we can make progress. And we will be leaving some things behind and that will probably feel uncomfortable. So it's telling people that they will feel uncomfortable through the process. Then when they actually do feel uncomfortable, if they do, it's likely that they will. You will have told them already and they'll be a little prepared and they won't be kind of coming up with this like, oh, but why are we doing this? What are we doing? Why are we doing it so fast? Other things like it's normal not to have ideas yet. Um, this is also something when you get further into the sprint exercises, it starts to become time to quickly try and think of some ideas, solutions. And it's good to remind people that they don't need to have all the ideas yet. It, 
get you build up slowly on the creation of ideas. And some people feel nervous that they're supposed to have all the ideas straight away. And it's normal to feel like it's not going to work. It's very common to feel that way. And at the end, we're always going to get the validation and the confirmation that we're after, but it's normal that you feel like this in the process. And it just helps alleviate people's fears a little bit when you say these things up front. So this is a big one, very simple, but really effective. Another really great way to um, help things go more smoothly is to cut out any exercises. And we've actually changed the, the sprint in, in the design sprint 2.0, which we now teach with Jake Knapp, the author, this new version of the sprint, um, is using the note and vote, which is a recurring thing through the sprint where people write things down, stick them up on the wall, vote on them, and then prioritize. Um, and using this, so often with most of the time with post-its, sticking things up, using those dots to vote on them, and then uh, prioritizing and ruling things out, really uh, refining and focusing on the things that are the most important and crucial. Using this in some exercises, you can even just use this in meetings. If there's a discussion going on that's taking too long, um, or you're really not getting anywhere and at the end of the meeting is coming, using this, um, this framework, this tool, really helps make progress fast. And as you're a facilitator, really helps you um, not have to juggle all of those disagreements and discussions that aren't going anywhere and trying to cut people off. So instead just going, great, let's note and vote this. Examples where we have actually changed the sprint used to use this um, method is in the long-term goal. For those that know that the original sprint, the long-term goal is created by the group, like what should be our vision? Where are we heading? so that while we're doing this sprint, we're all having the same goal in mind. We've replaced the discussion part of this with the note and vote method. So each person notes down what they think the goal should be, sticks it up, they, everyone votes on it, and then a decision is made really quickly. The same thing with the sprint questions, where everyone really just writes down some important questions that they think we should answer in the sprint, voting is done, and then the top three questions are picked by voting. And the final thing is a new exercise that we created just before the storyboard. For those who know the storyboard exercise, it's one of the most challenging, lots of discussions. You're trying to sketch up on a whiteboard, a uh, really picture of what your test will look like, what your prototype will be, that you're going to test this new idea. And before that, we've invented this note and vote step where everyone notes down what they think the steps of the test should be. Step one, they read a marketing page. Step two, they click on a particular thing. Step three, they go to the first feature. Step four, they go to the second feature. Really just saying, what are the steps? And then we can draw out each step. So we've really made it easier for ourselves, made it less stressful to facilitate and made it more smooth for the participants by using this note and vote exercise more. This is also a huge tip for less stress when facilitating. Now, how am I going? Seven minutes. How to give clear, clear instructions. Um, this is really key as well. Again, just removing stress and giving you more authority as a facilitator and more confidence and people feel like you know what you're doing when you limit the way that you give the direction to do each exercise. So there's a very simple formula that we use to help people know exactly what to do. And then you're not getting all these questions after you've explained the exercise. But what goes first? What, what comes next? Why are we doing this again? And the very simple formula is first the what, then the why, and then the how. It doesn't sound like rocket science, but if you think back to all of the sprints or other workshops that you've run, have you actually uh, structured your instructions like this? If you look and think about it, you might not have. Here's an example straight from our sprint deck. Um, that's an example of the note taking exercise, which is just before sketching happens. People take notes to really just start to formulate their thoughts and ideas and take notes of what's on the sprint walls around them, what they've done so far. So in this example, these are, these are really our sprint slides. First, there's what we're doing note taking. Why? Because writing thoughts allow, writing words allows your thoughts to form 
and get the creative juices flowing. That's why we're doing this exercise. It's not just for the sake of writing, it's to help you get to this next step and get creative. How do you do it? Here's a picture so you can see exactly what it looks like. So when you're doing it, you're like, yeah, I'm doing it just like the picture. And then the exact instructions step by step that are left up on the screen so that people can see exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Really simple, but so much more effective than just saying what people should do. And then people are really saying, oh, what did, what did she say? I was distracted. I was looking at something else. So really clear, really simple way of giving instructions so that your facilitation is much easier and you have to answer less questions. Last thing with giving really clear instructions is using insight statements. These are fantastic. This is when you're explaining an exercise that you can use this one, one of these statements to say, this is the big idea. This is why we're doing this. So these are three examples of great insight statements. The big idea with this exercise is, the most important thing about this is, or the way to do this exercise well is, and here's an example. With the heat map vote exercise, um, these are the slides that we use, and we would use an insight statement like, the way to do this exercise well is to use all of your dots. And this is where you really want people to place dots on every idea that they think is interesting or um, will solve the sprint problems. Uh, another one is the big idea with this um, is to get the opinions of the group, to collect the opinions of the group. So they're understanding why they're doing the exercise. And this also gives you the sense of authority. You're saying this is important. This is what's important about this. This is why we're doing it. And people really understand that you know why we're doing this and why this exercise is important. Okay, on to the special touches. So this is these are some of the things that AJ and Smart have really done to set ourselves apart from uh, anyone else that's running sprints, that's running workshops. We really want to deliver the best um, workshop that people have ever been to. And people tell us this all the time, that it has been the best workshop, the best activity that they've ever done. Um, and we really want it to be like that because we want people to come back to see us as the experts. So you can now steal all of these ideas and do it yourself. Um, the first one also maybe sounds obvious, but most of the time we see this doesn't happen in other places. Having a room that's full of light, that has windows that can open that we, so you can have air, that has plants and a nice environment for people to be in. So whenever we go and do um, sprints somewhere else, which is unusual, we really want people to come into our, um, our office, our sprint house. This is the picture from there because of this, because we control the environment and we make it really the most amazing workshop people have ever done. Um, but whenever we go somewhere else, it's never, it's never as good. It's never like this. We never have the view of the river, the windows with light and the um, and plants and really nice environment. So if possible, even if you don't have the windows and the river, get the plants, put some something on there that makes it feel interesting and, um, and a nice environment, cozy cushions, couches, whatever you can do. The next thing is these... We get um, to, uh, people talk about this all the time. I'm wearing them right now. We've got special um, employee black ones. These slippers um, that as soon as people walk into our office, we invite them to take their shoes off and put on our special AJS slippers, not just as a kind of fun gimmick, but also because it puts them into this comfort zone straight away. They feel like they're at home. They're somewhere where they can relax. We have also kind of cheeky things on the walls and um, fun stuff uh, everywhere. And this is really part of the, the vibe and the atmosphere and the attitude that we want to convey. So people feel at home, feel comfortable and feel like they can be themselves. This is a picture I just took today because I didn't have a good one from a real sprint, but we also have a proper espresso machine in our office and every one of us uh, knows how to use it and make really nice coffee for our clients. And we have coffee just constantly coming in um, as soon as anyone needs it. So this is just another touch that's like the CEO of the company can make you a cappuccino when you come and do a sprint with AJ and Smart. So these small, all these small touches really add up. Got one minute left, but I'm going really well. I'm almost at the end. But uh, if it beeps, I'm going to turn the volume down a little bit. Okay. So the last special touch 
um, is actually a rearranging of some of the sprint exercises. In the original sprint from three years ago, this is what it looked like. So it was actually five days and the whole group was needed for the first three to do this workshop, figuring out the problem, figuring out the solution ideas and everything together before a um, smaller team could go and build a prototype and do the testing. And we actually rearranged the exercises, shortened, especially the expert interview, right, really right down to just 30 minutes instead of half a day. And the map also down from several hours to um, 30 minutes. And we now have a four day sprint in the design sprint 2.0. So this does a bunch of things. It means you only need to get the whole team. Maybe you want the CEO or the VP of product or different people in your sprint. This means you only need to ask them for two days and that makes a big difference for them. It also means if teams like ours are doing sprints all the time, there's my timer, but I'm really close to being done, Marianne. Um, that you get the Fridays to do retrospectives and look back at what you've done and have that breathing space. So the four days means uh, a lot. And also in this reorganization, we've made sure that at each big break, like lunchtime at the end of the, and at the end of the day, there's an exercise that has a sense of achievement at that spot. So on the first day, you just finish the map together and that's a sense of achievement. And then you have lunch. Then at the end of the day, you finish sketching and then you have a big sense of achievement. You just created your own concept sketch. So at every big break, there's a high point. So you're never finishing and breaking on something that's felt really challenging or um, you're not sure where it's ending up. Whew. So this is the main chunk of content and I'm just going to now finish up on what you can look at and watch next to keep learning more and keep seeing more, especially um, we share a lot of stuff. So the first thing, the place where we really share so much information is on YouTube. We have over a hundred hours of design sprint videos on YouTube. So you can find everything from every detail of the sprint exercises to things like what I've been talking about, how to facilitate, how to prepare, um, and endless, I can't describe it all. There's so much content on YouTube. And then we have uh, Instagram as well. We have daily stories that are about sprints, but also about design and product and about running a design sprint agency. So if you've joined today because you're interested in running sprints yourself as a service, selling sprints um, or changing your company to work uh, more in sprints, then you might find our Instagram really interesting. There's constantly stories about how we do things internally here at AJ and Smart. And then finally, we have a free one hour web class that the, one of the founders and the CEO of AJ and Smart, Jonathan, um, does uh, this one hour web class. We've had a few of them um, in the past. The uh, current one that he's running, which has been really popular, is how to run and sell design sprints like a pro. So this is uh, really, we just get tons and tons of great feedback. It's another free way that you can really see a lot about what we do and how we've changed our agency to work in this way and how well it's working for us. So if you want to join this, please um, do. There's a link there. I think the slides are going to be shared with you as well afterwards. So I don't think you can click the link right now in uh, this. I'm not sure, but you can, we'll be able to click it in the slides when they're shared with you. Um, and that's it. That's the end. I was only a couple of minutes over. Um, so that's the end. And I think we've got time for some questions. Yeah. And again, one, one more thing, guys, is again, if D mentioned the, the, their course. Uh, I think it's worth it for you guys who want to go deep. Uh, the ROI should be there, uh, especially thinking about like all those wasted hours in meetings or, or failed yeah. projects. There should be a lot of things to learn there and share with your teams. So we'll also yeah. to, to that and, and yeah. So, but again. Yeah, thanks very much, Mary. We have you here and we have a lot of questions. Ooh. So I've, I've, been, I've been selecting a few. And one that is, that is I think it's, it's a relevant one for everybody, especially in, in, in this constant rhythm of things to do, things to do. You mentioned two cases of, of sprints for new stuff, right? So new ideas, new something. But what if it's, we have, we have other cases or when, when is it good to run a design sprint in, yeah. in, in, in your like week to week, month to month uh, life? So when, when to run a design sprint? 
Yeah, and when when something is, that it's not necessarily new, new, new. Yeah. Change, okay. Change. Yeah, so there's, there, we've got some great YouTube videos about this topic as well. But um, when it's not a new idea, then really the core, um, the key factors are if it's really a mission critical, really important topic, that's got to be the first number one. If it's not, because when you run a design sprint, you really need to pull the people who need to be involved, especially the people who actually have the decision-making power, they need to be in that room. So it could be that heads, head of a department or head of design or even the CEO of the company. Um, and you need to get those people in the room. So for example, a, an example when not to run a design sprint would be if you have, a, you need to uh, improve the UX of your website. And it's really about improving the usability, improving the um, a UX problem in your website. Or, or mobile app or anything. So this is an example where it could be really critical. Maybe you're losing a certain number of users or you're not converting users. But if it's something where the problem could be solved by people who have the, the knowledge and capacity of how to solve this type of problem, so a UX problem is a good example, um, it's n probably not necessarily needed that you need to pull people from different departments and different teams to bring their knowledge together to um, to tackle this problem that could have uh, many different solutions. A UX example is a great one because you could put one or two UX designers to apply some methods that they know of how to how to find the answers to solve the us usability problem, um, and they could get a good solution going. So this is a really great way to think about it. If the answer is not known. There's a problem that needs to be solved and it's, there has complex moving parts. It's important to the business and you need to have the different perspectives of different people from the business. That's when it's great to use a design sprint because it will take, the answer isn't known and it will take you a lot longer to find an answer and it might not be the right one. Then you need to come together and find a solution together that's a good chance of succeeding and then use the design sprint to validate whether that's going to work quickly. Uh, Did that answer the full question or was there also part of that that was about how frequently? I didn't ask you about how frequently, but you know what? <laughs> how frequently? <laughs> we get asked this all the time, um, especially in large organizations. I say, how, how often should we run a design sprint? There's two parts of this um, answer. And the first one is don't try and change everything all at once and go, oh my God, we've, we've got the answer now. We're just going to do design sprints all the time. In this, like, just start with a lighthouse project of something that's critical, that is the situation I described that has complex parts and you'll find a solution really quickly with a sprint and then make sure you showcase that to the rest of the business and then get the rest, like, other teams slowly on board just by showing how much time you saved and how successful it was when you did this. And then the second answer is if the business is already kind of sold and people are using design sprints, then it really depends on your normal processes. A lot of companies have something like quarterly project cycles. Then it's really great to put the design sprint into that system you already have, into the beginning of your project cycle. So maybe once a quarter is a good time to run sprints. Maybe there's lots of departments in the company that run their uh, own project cycles. Maybe they can each run one every quarter, choose one to there's Run a, a guy called Jeff Gottheld, and he talks about uh, how like Scrum has no brain or Agile has no brain because it's when you can build, 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 build. And he talks about like sneaking in a learning sprint uh, in your in your Agile cadences so that uh, you learn. And this is again this, the design sprint is all about learning, really. Uh, yeah. And then you go and execute. Uh, so the folks in engineering that are very familiar with with Agile cadences, either one week, two week. Uh, development sprints, try to, once per quarter, get, yeah. get a, a alignment and understanding in that design sprint. Yeah, more than once per quarter, we don't see working so well because people get burned out from doing, if it's once a month doing a design sprint, people get burned out. You need to implement and take action on what comes out of a design sprint. So the, another question, I mean, from this slide, so like, 
for folks needing to sell internally or externally, there's this one hour course, but do you have a, a case of, of, of someone that came into a sprint, like doubting a little bit and, and, and then they, their eyes open wide, someone that was a like, disbeliever then after something happened, they say, okay, this is the thing. Yeah, every almost every sprint, um, and I think the most convincing thing for almost every everyone that has this light bulb moment is the videos of the user tests. This is something I didn't talk about yet that we record all of the user tests, which are 30, 45 minute interviews with your target users or your existing customers, where you're testing this new idea this new prototype that you've, that you've made. Um, and when you show this, to, when the people in the sprint team see this, or when you take a, a video like this and show it to your boss, someone else in your organization, this is when you really see a user holding this new concept, going like, oh, cool, this, I'm, I'm totally gonna book this. Like, oh, oh this, this really solves that problem that I was telling you about where I couldn't, um, this didn't make sense for my life and now it does. When you really hear users saying, people, the target users saying these words, holding this product and saying this, this is when the light bulb goes off for everyone. So if you're running sprints and you're not recording your user tests and you're trying to figure out how to convince um, your teammates, your boss, your, um, yeah, your company, record the user tests and show them and use this as the showcase. John McGuinness was asking, what, what do you say to deliver to your client at the end of the sprint? I think that nothing more powerful than that, right? Like who cares, yeah. of it knows who cares about the prototype even. What's more important is like the, the learning and the user reaction, right? Yeah, so we have a, a report that we write, which we also use our Fridays, some of our Fridays for, because we have this four day sprint um, that uh, we really outline to our clients uh, everything. So the really documentation of all of the feedback, we record all of those user interviews and also give them a two minute um, summary video of the user tests, good and bad the reactions. Um, and then we give a full summary of the recommendations based on that feedback and itemized, especially a list of um, features or the pieces of the, the concept of the prototype that was tested. And uh, the most uh, yeah, useful thing is then a basically product backlog. So a prioritized list of the features or the parts of the concept that the company should implement first. So based on um, effort and impact and the feedback of the different parts of the idea, they basically have a run sheet, have a product backlog that they can give to their development teams with the design, with the working prototype that they can start to base their implementation on so they just know exactly what to start implementing and when so it's a full really huge report that really gives our recommendation the summary of that feedback and that prioritized feature backlog with every like this is where you should start and this is step two this is step three this is step four and in in, in the case of of what we we recommend also i think access back to the working space murals uh, so that people can understand again the, the why behind those decisions as well right so like that's another thing yeah right so yeah exactly so in yeah in our case when we, we do some remote sprints but we do a lot of in-person sprints so we're also delivering then uh the photo exactly the photos and the records of the for our example um maybe 80 percent of the time is in person in the room sprint then the photos of the wall. So in the case of a remote sprint, it's the exactly the, the show, the snapshot of the mural and that working space. So you can see this is how those decisions decisions got made. This is where the votes fell. This is the concept sketches, and this is the parts of those concepts that were used in the final prototype. They can really see that flow of how all the decisions got made. Exactly. Yep. So we'll go into tech in a second. And by the way, we we are we're opening up the beta slowly to mural scan mural.co slash scan yeah so not take a picture but actually a I uh, signed up. yeah the thing folks listening go there and sign up it looks so I, cool ios first sorry android guys 
So we're going to <laughs> tech and remote in a second, but I think this was interesting from Eric Marshall. So in your experience, where has a design sprint failed and where, which were the red flags when it occurred? And something that you didn't talk about, and we talked in our, in our, in our dry run before, is the follow-on sprint, right? So can, can you expand a little more on Yeah. Sprints? I actually ended up removing this from my slides. I wish I hadn't removed it now. Did I actually keep it in here? Damn it. Um, because I had so much content and you saw I, I only just made the time. Um, we So this question, when, when do we see sprints failing? We have implemented a setup that makes sure that it never fails. This sounds crazy, I know, but it's just true. Um, we do a, it, a normal sprint. We always sell our our sprints in two week blocks so we always have a regular sprint uh, those four days uh, first and then immediately the week after an iteration week i'm really annoyed that i took this slide out sorry mariana um an iteration week where we look at the uh, feedback from the tests we do a few of the exercises again kind of starting from what what worked well with the feedback what what were people saying worked well what didn't work so well Let's come up with new ideas, new concepts to fix that stuff that's not working well and do some new concept sketches, re-update the prototype with this new iterations and then test again. So it's really a similar week, but with less in it. So just a few of the exercises to come up with some new ideas to solve those key issues and iterate the prototype and test again. And then by the end of this, you have an absolute sure winner. You know exactly the direction to go in we like we use this analogy of if you were in a dark room and you knew there was a dartboard on the wall somewhere um the first week the first sprint is like having a shot in the dark and you don't know where that dartboard is but you're seeing if you get there and the end of the first week the lights come on and you see oh the dartboard was here and my dart went over there but now i know where the dartboard is so i'm just going to fix everything to really get that aim dead on to that dartboard. And then you have a second shot and then you really nail it. So this is how we absolutely guarantee that there's a successful outcome in our design sprints. This and, when, and when it comes to like organizing the day, the week and so on, that's a, a very important. That's a more deep dive on that in the online masterclass. Also a yeah. special chapter on how to deal with complicated people, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, this slide, these slides I did keep in. I've got special bonus material. Uh, um, <laughs> I forgot to put the iteration sprint in. Dealing with skeptics and troublemakers. This is a really big one. This is also in my advanced facilitation training. This is only, I'm not, I'm not going to go into every detail here, but this has been a lifesaver for me. Understanding different personality types and just the quick, simple ways that you can address when you see, ah, this is a, for example, if you look at the gamma, the green gamma person there, um, this type of person is process oriented and they're a real team player. If you give them tasks, they know exactly what's happening and what the steps are and uh, give them clear direction and don't put them on the spot and make them feel uh, nervous and threatened. And then they'll really um, be a great team player for you. But the alpha personality, if you start to spot this kind of person that's really um, wanting to take over a little bit, challenging things and, and acting like they know more than you, then you can do things like um, help them feel like they're more in control um, and feel like they're empowered and feel validated. And it's on the next slide here as well. So things like capturing their ideas and saying, great, that's a fantastic idea. I'm going to write it up here on the map um, or we're going to keep that for the um, lightning demos uh, section later and um, using the note and vote with them as well. So saying, this is fantastic. Everything you're saying is gold. Could you please write this down on these post-it notes because we want to make sure we've got that up on the board so, uh, so that we can, so that it's part of, um, part of the ideas. So I would normally go in a lot more detail with, um, with okay. these things, but I'll leave that slide up in case people are really interested to uh, take a screenshot or something. And, and this and is I really think that a lot of these things apply to regular meetings and something that I've been yeah. you know, observing a lot is like, I mean, it would be great to have a master, screen master or facilitator in, in all important meetings, right? Yeah. Expensive, uh, but, but in a way, I mean, someone observing the, the team dynamic 
provide so much value and that's why you're being booked all the time by, by yeah. companies. Not, not because of, I, I think it's, it's a dual thing. It's, oh, it's because of the problem at can and solving it properly. But the other thing is like improving the team dynamic and, 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 and how to get the most out of all those people. Yeah, there's really a, a big difference between um, knowing, learning the process and knowing a process like a design sprint and learning the, the art of facilitation and acting as a guide for the people that you're having in that room and not just being frustrated when people aren't following the process but understanding exactly different people, different agendas, different personalities and knowing how to react and guide them in a more productive direction is really a, a difficult art, but something that you can actually slowly learn, learn tricks and hacks and through experience as well. But it's really is, um, yeah, learnable. So, so D, uh, given our audience, any adaptations to all of this when you have to deal with a remote team? Ah, yeah. Okay. So cool. I've got this in my bonus material as well. Um, the, I was trying to think of some of the things that the, the biggest differences when running a remote sprint, um, and I've got three down here. These are the top three things that you'll need to watch out for, things that will change, things that won't be the same uh, as when you're running an in-person sprint. Um, the timing I think uh, the first mistake a lot of people make uh, is thinking that everything can be kept at the same timing and the same structure, especially if it's remote because people are in different countries and different time zones. Um, you might need to spread things out. This would be different. There's no uh, standard answer for what your timing should be because you might have people in different time zones, but you'll need to um, spend also more time explaining to people how things actually work. So all the instructions of uh, what, why, um, and how, really more time explaining and even uh, onboarding people and giving people more information before you even start the sprint so that they understand exactly what's going to happen. Otherwise, you'll find you'll slow down during the day because uh, people will be not understanding exactly what they're doing. And then giving... The timing will change also because you'll need to give blocks of work for people. So maybe even giving a chunk of time overnight to do the concept sketching because maybe some people are asleep and they need to do their concept sketch in the morning and some people are um, in the uh, evening and they need the rest of the evening to do their sketch. So giving these like chunks where it's like, okay, we break now and we meet back again at this time. So this is something that maybe sounds obvious, but you need to think ahead to how this is going to work before you do it. You talk about and splitting, splitting this in, in, in smaller chunks. Yeah. And also doing micro time boxing because attention spans and, 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 and focus are harder to maintain through a screen. So for all of yeah. us, uh, 55 minutes into the webinar, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> So, but, but yes, and, and there's more tips. We, we, we actually put together a little ebook on on best practices in remote facilitation. Uh, Mural.co slash ebook. I shared in the chat. There's more there. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, so this is a this is a really big thing, and um and doing the preparation stuff as well um is a necessary part for this as well. And then there's more confusion. I already touched on this. Um, people just it's a lot harder to. Um, get everyone on the same page, understanding what's going on when you, exactly you're talking through screens and there might be different um, internet connection <laughs> issues. The, a, big, um, a big tip is, if possible, try and do uh, something at least, uh, another workshop or a sprint, or check that people have been in a sprint before, if possible, um, before you do that first sprint all together. If there's maybe one person that hasn't done a sprint and the rest of the team has, that's probably going to be okay. But if you're trying to run a sprint with everyone for the first time that you haven't met in person and they haven't done a sprint at all before, that can make it a lot trickier. And then this, But then the second, third, all the other sprints, once people know what's happening, can be super smooth and quick. So if possible, don't do it with a whole group of first-timers for the first time remotely. And, and, and 
<laughs> adding on top of that, we actually recommend folks onboarding to the tooling beforehand, probably with, with a pre-icebreaker, like in general, we do something similar, something little around like introduce yourselves at a picture that describes you, yeah. what, expectations and so on. But in a lunch and learn a week before, or, yeah. or the preparation towards it, this because yes, getting into onboarding people with a very I mean short period of time that you'll have a lot of I mean short together time. Okay. Yeah. Onboard them to the tooling beforehand. Yeah. So the tool, the definitely the tools, so they know what they're using and how to use it. And also if they are first timers for sprints in general then onboard them also to the concept of the sprint. So you're not having to, so you can absolutely use the AJ and Smart videos on YouTube yeah. to do this. There's a lot of videos that just explain what sprints are and exactly what each exercise looks like so that they can just watch a few minute videos. Um, and talk about the, um, the flipped workshop approach where like in flipped classrooms, I mean, teachers send videos in advance and then they maximize it together time for project work, which is- the Yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's really, it makes a lot of uh, difference if you just a little bit of time beforehand. And then, of course, there's the digital and the physical difference. It's a lot different when you're writing something on post-it notes and sticking them at your desk and writing something on a whiteboard altogether. Um, and the difference between this physical, um, everyone seeing in the room at the same time what's happening. Um, and if you don't have a good tool for this, but this is an obvious one, um, then you're really, people will get lost. So you need to pick a good tool. I've heard of a good one <laughs> um, and, and, and set it up the way that will work for you as well so that it's clear to everyone then and onboarding people exactly that these are the spaces that we're going to be using. This is the first one. This is the second one. Don't worry about this yet. Make sure they're just familiar with that area, that um, yeah, that place that they're going to be working on. The other note on that is like video is as important as the documentation space. So try to get two screens per location so that the videos are always present and permanent there. Yeah. So that people, yeah. you, you remember that everybody's there and you walk through their faces and, and eyes. And yeah. then the other side, what you see. Uh, of course, this is all for the first few days. But something that I'm going to ask you is like, have you run? With, with, uh, to, to, I mean, last question actually. Yeah. You prototype remotely and test remotely, right? And, yes. And likewise, which is also complicated, have you done something with a service? Like, have you prototyped a service? Yeah. Okay. So the first questions we do um, most of our prototyping and testing remotely. We do a lot of our testing remotely. So using video. Um, chat tools to do our actual user interviews and um, and using digital prototypes that we then send through the just a link to, to a um, prototype for people to test with. So this is really most of what we do because we're often wanting to test products in different uh, regions, countries, time zones, all these different kinds of things. Um, so I don't know if, how much more detail you want on that, but we don't have time anyway, maybe. And prototyping, we do all of the prototyping, AJ and Smart, uh, the clients go, our clients go back to their offices and we do the whole prototype. So for example, today, one of our prototypers has a cold, the other one is sitting here in the office and they're working using Figma uh, together collaboratively. So this is also, could they could be in, one could be in China and one could be in, um, yeah, Poland. That's a um, digital process and that's great. And you know what, Dee, we'll pause yeah. here. And maybe we have another uh, webinar just focused on service design yeah. and service because that, that's a big, big topic. We're sponsoring an event in a few weeks around a topic. And I think that most things, there's definitely going to be a digital component to them, but there's also people yeah. involved. So I think it's a yeah. nice one to, to wrap it up. Thank you great. very much for your time. Uh, we, are, we, we squeeze the full hour because there's a lot of things to comment. I mean, just to, for you to know, it's been one of the most active webinars in terms of questions and answers, or at least questions. Cool. We didn't have enough time for all of the answers. So expect more follow-up uh, digitally after this. And yeah. thanks for your attention. And, and again, Dee, hopefully we meet each other again and, and share something new to the world.
Yeah, I hope so. Thanks so much for having me, Mariana. I had a really great time. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Remember to check out the class. And there, there'll always be hiring. Some people were asking about hiring. So, uh, yeah, great. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cheers. Bye. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye.